Hey guys, we're going to talk about sleep cycles in this lecture. This is just an overview of the basics of sleep cycles. There's a lot of uh, research on this, um, many uh, spanning many, many years of work, but we're just gonna cover the basics. So just to remind you, I covered this when we talked about the basic terms of sleep, um, <clears throat> But I, I do want, you know, we're going much more specific now. I do want to remind you that there's two types of sleep. We have non-REM sleep and we have REM sleep. Remember, REM stands for rapid eye movement. Um, when you see it uh, uppercase like this, it's referring to the type of sleep. When you see it lowercase, R-E-M, that's referring to rapid eye movements, meaning that those are the actual movements that you're, you're, you're making. Um, so there is a difference there. Um, when we talk about REM being its own sort of type of sleep, it's not broken into any stages, it's just its own type of sleep. Whereas non-REM sleep is broken up into four stages. We have stages one and two, which is a drowsy uh, sleep for stage one, uh, getting into sleep, and then stage two, which is light sleep. And then we have stages three and four, which is considered slow wave sleep because we see these very large uh, slow delta waves during this period. And of course, the best way to measure what type of sleep you're in and what stage is using polysomnography or PSG. We have EEG, which measures the uh, brain waves, EOG, which is measuring the eye movements, and EMG, which measures muscle movements. We, of course, also take heart rate and we take breathing and we take a lot of other measurements during PSG. But the three main ones that we really need to show us what stage and type of sleep we're in are the brain waves because it's going to tell us course, um, what kind of waves that, that um, are, are being emitted by, uh, by our neurons. Um, we will also need eye movements because it'll tell us if we're in REM, because if the eyes are moving back and forth, then we know that's a sign that we could be in REM. And then EMG is important for muscle movement because REM, for example, is a lack of muscle tone. You go pretty much completely paralyzed. And so uh, when we look at the muscle tension in the neck, that can show us uh, if you're in REM or if you're in a different stage. Think of it this way, when you're sitting in class and things get a little, you know, a little boring and you feel your head start to nod, well, you're losing muscle tone in your neck. You're not going into REM sleep necessarily, but as you start losing that tone, um, it gives us a signal that you're likely entering uh, into sleep. So this is kind of a typical setup here. You can see this particular kid has, and I'm going to get a... Uh, I'm going to get a, a spotlight on here so that you guys can see. So here we have, uh, these are going to measure the, the brain waves. Um, we have, we can also measure temperature, but this is also for uh, grounding. This is going to measure the, um, the eye uh, movements. This is going to measure breathing. Um, and then this is important for um, the muscles. Uh, so looking at neck muscles. And we can have other uh, uh, setups as well. And you can't see this, but we typically have um, electrodes on the, on the chest as well to measure um, heart rate and to measure uh, the chest. So here we can see um, the spotlight on here again. You can see here that there are sensors, uh, again, for the eyes, for the brain waves, for the neck muscles. And then here you can see the bands, which can measure things like um, breathing. Um, this can measure oxygen um, level uh, for uh, that as well. So you can actually measure oxygen in the, in the blood and see how much, uh, what percentage of, of oxygen that person is getting. This is especially important to see that these uh, uh, polysomnographies, that if you've ever had a sleep issue um, where the doctor thinks you might have like, for example, sleep apnea, which is when you stop breathing in your sleep, um, then you might actually have had this done before. And you might see that uh, you might recognize a lot of these, these wires being hooked up. Um, and of course, uh, in this case, uh, this can tell us how many times you, you stop breathing in your sleep, how much your oxygenation is um, during the night. And um, if you, know, you are, for example, experiencing some sort of issue uh, that is related to a sleep disorder. Now, when we look at uh, the brain, 
Um, you can see that the brain has different hertz, and, and there's actually other brain waves that we don't really talk about much, but the, the four main ones that we're going to talk about are alpha, beta, theta, and delta. And uh, based on the electrodes, uh, the information that we get from the electrodes can tell us what kind of brain activity you're experiencing overall. Now, one thing you'll notice is that there's only a few electrodes that, that are placed um, on the scalp for polysomnography. If you were to do an, uh, like an EEG study, an actual study, you would actually have many more electrodes placed on the brain, uh, on the scalp, um, to measure different areas of the brain and be able to map that onto a person's brain. But the problem is, is that uh, we can't use a full cap EEG when someone's sleeping because it causes interference. When you move around, anytime you move, anytime you blink, it actually does cause what we refer to as an artifact, which is unreadable data. Um, and so it's very difficult to get full EEG readings. So we just get kind of the basic idea of whole brain activity. Um, now there are studies that have done full EEG during sleep. Those are usually very far and few between, but very well done studies usually um, looking at you know brain activity um, throughout sleep, um, throughout the night for the whole brain in different areas of the brain. Um, but when we look at EEG for polysomnography, it's only just a few electrodes and they can only really tell us if we're experiencing synchrony across the, the, the neurons or desynchrony. It doesn't really give us, you know, really specific, those particular electrodes don't give us specific, like this is exactly in the brain, this is where this activity is happening. So you, we do have to be careful about our conclusions with that. But given the amount of hertz that, that we're reading on the, the EEG, we can tell if you have alpha, beta, theta, or delta waves. And so that helps us determine what stage of sleep that you're in and what type of sleep that you're getting. When you're awake, you generally experience alpha and beta activity, usually beta activity if you're alert and, and you know, doing something. Alpha activity we start seeing when you're, when you're relaxed. Um, and desynchrony is experienced when you're alert and you're awake and you're thinking about things because the neurons are um, sort of uh, all all firing in your brain. And so think of it this way, um, and they're not self firing together. Think of it this way, there's a, there's a myth that we only use 10% of our brain. That is an absolute terrible, just awful myth because we don't use just 10% of our brain. We use all of our brain and we use all of our brain most all of the time. Even when we sleep, especially when we sleep, our brain isn't resting. Um, there are areas of the brain that are actually much more active when we sleep than when we're awake. So our brain is still very busy doing things um, at all times. And if you don't use a part of your brain, um, for example, if you have a stroke and you lose oxygen and to a particular part of your brain and your brain stops getting blood flow or stops being used, it actually dies. So we need to use our neurons or they will actually, um, they, they will die. Um, so just to kind of give you a rundown again, the types of sleep, we have non-REM sleep, which you see here is represented as NREM, um, that's stages one through four. We have slow wave sleep, uh, which uh, we see the synchronization of the neurons, that's stages three and four, and then rapid eye movement, which is a different type. To the right here is a uh, sleep architecture hypnogram um, type uh, image, and we're going to go into a little bit more detail with that. It's easier to see when it's on its side, um, and so we'll go into more detail about that later. When we talk about non-REM sleep, in particular stage one, we see this sort of very drowsy phase. Um, you might see some um, uh, going from, you know, a beta, the beta activity of being alert. Um, you start might see a little bit of beta, um, but you generally see it move into alpha. So alpha is this sort of getting into a very relaxed state. Um, if you look at the stage one sleep, um, the one on the bottom, it shows some theta activity. Uh, we tend to see that a little bit here and there, but generally you see it go from beta to alpha and alpha being really relaxation. Um, we also see an increased synchrony in firing, but everything is not completely synchronous. Um, and we, in technicians whose job it is to sit and look at the, um, the whole thing while you're sleeping, because you actually, when you do a sleep test, whether it's in a hospital, whether it's at a lab, whatever, wherever it is, there is a technician that has to be there and they have to watch you. There's actually 
cameras in the room. They have to actually watch not only the electrodes, but they also have to watch you to make sure that you're safe. Um, and then they, they score your sleep as, as you sleep. And so um, one thing that you typically see is that um, sleep onset, which is you falling asleep, is much harder to determine than when you wake up because it's a transition. As you are going to sleep, um, it's very gradual. It goes, you know, you start seeing this beta activity of alertness to start kind of falling into an alpha activity. You start seeing some, some muscle relaxation and it kind of all occurs in a very gradual way. But when you wake up, okay, that is, is pretty, pretty, pretty easy to determine because you get this super shift to uh, awake activity in terms of alpha waves and you also see movement artifact meaning that you're actually moving around and that kind of disrupts the data a little bit so this is just a 30 sec 30 second epic which is a point in time um, of what it looks like the eog on the top uh, that's the left eye and then below that's the right eye and then you see the emg which is the muscle movement and uh, you see the eeg at the bottom which is um, your brain waves so you can see that they have these little um, not your, your muscle <clears throat> intonation, your muscle tonation is still there. Um, and you can see some theta waves, uh, start to, to, to take over the EEG. Now, um, an artifact, uh, as you can see, I'm going to go ahead and get the spotlight here, right here. This is an artifact. Um, so this is essentially something moving. Um, and this is, you know, it's so bad that it's actually interfering with the EOG, um, the right eye electrode. Um, and it's actually uh, um, uh, messing up in, in the eye, uh, the left eye as well is, is, is completely off the, the chart. Um, EEG again, completely off the chart. Um, that's just somebody's moving around and trying to get comfortable. And so you actually can't read that data. You have to kind of, you have to edit it out. Um, now with stage two, this is transitioning from stage one being, you know, the, the transition period to stage two being a light, quiet sleep. We see this a lot in cats and primates um, and uh, not necessarily in all the other animals. Um, we see something very specific here that we don't see a lot of times in other types of, of sleep. Now we're going to talk a little bit about, about this. We don't know a ton about sleep spindles and kit complexes, but I'm just going to briefly mention um, that they are seen in sleep. Um, and so I'm going to show you guys here. I've got some other, um, some other uh, examples here, but this would be an example of a spindle. You see this really dark um, kind of, you know, very, very, very broad, um, uh, bold activity here. And then a K complex you see as a big dip right here. And so um, we're not really sure what causes these. And, and the problem is we have a lot of speculation because we've done some studies on it. But uh, the problem is, is that it's hard to recreate. And if you're telling somebody, oh, this is definitely what it is, and you should be able to replicate that time and time again. So um, one argument for both sleep spindles and K-complexes is, is that uh, in past studies, we see these in, um, in response to uh, a sound or in a, um, something that is loud enough or powerful enough to create a, a change in your EEG, but not strong enough to wake you. So it would be kind of like somebody making a really loud noise, but the noise isn't loud enough to wake you up, but it's loud enough for your brain to process it. So we think that this might be the brain's way of sort of jamming out any sort of unimportant stimuli. It's like, hey, I see you, I see you there but it's not enough to, to, it's not important enough to wake you up. Um, so, you know, it could be that this is how the brain is processing sensory information and weeding out things that are not important and things that are important, but it's still not very clear because it doesn't, we can't replicate this every single time we have a noise, for example, that's loud enough uh, not to wake you. So it's very difficult to, to pinpoint. 
So sleep spindles is a little bit more specific here. I don't expect you to know the absolute details um, in terms of like memorization, but I do want you to know kind of what we know about them. So these sleep spindles, and this is a this is pulled from an Andrelin paper, um, just kind of broken down and trying to understand what a sleep spindle is and then how to detect it and what's the threshold for seeing a particular amplitude. Um, and we see this about a 10 to 16 Hertz oscillation. It lasts about a half a second to two seconds. Um, and so we see this in, re in reference to memory consolidation. So we see this when we have somebody learning something and then at night um, we have, uh, we see that uh, this is probably in relation to the person processing those memories. Um, we also see this in terms of cortical development. Um, and again, could be due to learning, it could be doing, due to um, the growth and maturation of the brain. We see this in arousal, like I said before, about um, you know uh, something being loud enough to make an a, a impact on your brain, but not loud enough to wake you up. And this might be the brain's way of maintaining some sort of disconnect or, 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 or connection to the external environment. And so one thing that's really important is thinking about the thalamus. So we haven't gotten to the brain yet, but if you know anything about the brain, you know that the thalamus is important for uh, being sort of a filter. So it filters through sensory information and allows us to know what's important to attend to and what's not. And so one thing that we see is that um, in the case of sleep spindles, we think that the thalamic gate is at work here. And so uh, it, what could be happening is it's maintaining some connection to the external environment and allowing only what's important through to wake us. So for example, if we are sleeping and somebody makes a loud noise, but it's not dangerous to us, our thalamic gate's responsibility is to determine is it is it a threat to us and should we wake up? If you're sleeping and you smell smoke and there's a fire, then that should go through the thalamic gate and awaken you and say, okay, you need to wake up because this is dangerous to you. Now I have schizophrenia on here because this is a really interesting, uh, what seemingly non-related thing, but it actually I think is quite related. So we see that individuals with schizophrenia do have abnormal numbers of sleep spindles that are produced. And what could be happening essentially is, and, and we do see the thalamus being an issue in people with schizophrenia, is that the uh, Individuals with schizophrenia may not have a properly functioning thalamic gate. And that makes a lot of sense because what ends up happening is that uh, individuals with schizophrenia tend to have hallucinations and tend to have a lot of sensory input that gets through that normally shouldn't. Because think about, you know, you, know, you might be getting a signal that you hear something, but if your thalamic gate is operating the way it should, then it should cut that signal off and you don't hear it. You don't, it doesn't come to consciousness. Whereas in schizophrenia, there may be too much activity there. And what ends up happening is that that signal does get through. And so they feel like they hear something and that is interpreted as a hallucination. And so what we might find is that if we are you know, better able to uh, correct this thalamic gate in individual schizophrenia, we may be able to reduce some of their symptoms um, for, for overload in terms of sensory uh, input. Now, K complexes again. You know, we know that they're they have some. They they must serve some some purpose. Um, you know, we see this in terms of a, of a sharp negative EEG, and is followed by a high voltage uh, slow wave. Here, you can see that big old slow wave um, it occurs at about half a second. You may see it with a sleep spindle, but it doesn't necessarily have to occur in a, with a sleep spindle. Um, you typically see this in stage two. Um, I have N2 here, but that represents non-REM stage two. But you can also see this in slow wave sleep. So one complication is that K complexes are a little bit harder to, to distinguish because they can be seen in slow wave sleep and they're, they're hard to, to figure out where are they in these, these very large waves, delta waves. Um, K-complexes are hotly debated in terms of why we have them. Again, it could be an arousal thing. Um, it could be our response to an arousing stimulus. It's very, um, very hard um, to, to, to pinpoint exactly what is causing um, the K-complexes. Um, we, we know that it tends to occur when you're sleeping very deeply and, you're, and it's harder to disturb you. And again, it must could be related to some sort of 
um, of, of deep sleep. So that's something that you have to really consider of being an issue with, uh, with K complexes. So this is a typical, um, this is a typical epic of stage two. Here you can see at the bottom, you can see some K complexes here. You can see a sleep spindle right here. This is a really, really dark um, sort of uh, uh, accompanying, a, a dark wave accompanying a K complex. Again, the K complex does not necessarily have to occur with the sleep spindle, but we do typically see that. Um, occurring together. Now, <clears throat> so when you look, and this is an example of a screenshot pulled from an actual uh, N2 uh, epic. So you can see here uh, the eyes moving here. Uh, you can see the right and left eye, and then you can also see the muscle movement here. And this is a typical EEG to read with the different electrodes. Each electrode is putting out a different um, a different line. Here you can actually see a uh, a K complex very lightly there, um, and uh, excuse me, a sleep spindle here and a K complex here. Um, again, these are these are difficult sometimes to pick up on. You have to be really heavily trained to be able to to pick up on those. Um, and then when you're looking at, um, for example, when you're looking at the uh, stages three and four, we're seeing a really hard time disting distinguishing between the two. Um, when it comes to uh, being a trained technician and you're sitting down and you've got the, the, the waves in front of you and you're trying to distinguish it, um, because over the course of time we know that, that individuals have a problem distinguishing because they, they tend to be very difficult, we now sort of refer to this as stages three dash four or three slash four. Uh, the American Academy of Sleep Med in 2007 decided we're just going to combine them. But you do see sometimes that some papers and some authors and some scientists will actually split the two. But this is just a good example of, um, of just the difficulty of being able to distinguish it. Because sometimes it's, it, you know, when you get to right here and you're, you're trying to figure out, well, okay, the delta activity started. We know we're in stage three. When it goes from three to four, it's very gradual, so it's very difficult sometimes to say for sure exactly what stage you're currently in or at what point you moved into stage four. This is a 30 second epic of PSG. Um, you can see the slow wave sleep here, these really large, nice uh, high amplitude waves. Um, and you can see that there is some eye movement, but it's not um, necessarily uh, rhythmic. Um, and you also see there's still some uh, uh, intonation of uh, the um, the muscles, the, the tonation of the muscles. Now, moving on to REM, uh, so this is an example of REM sleep. Here you can see that this is a very different EMG rhythm. You've actually lost your 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 muscle um, ability, and here um, you've lost tonation, so you're basically paralyzed. Um, occasionally, you might see some twitching, which does occur during REM. Um, and here you can see this is a really, really neat pattern here. This is essentially the rolling of the eyes going back and forth. So here you see it's actually a mirrored pattern here. Um, and this is the, the eyes sort of going from one direction to the other. And the reason why they're mirrored is because you have the electrodes on either side of the head. Um, EEG, you can see this is really nice. Um, uh, uh, fast frequency, low intensity waves. We call them sawtooth waves because they actually look very similar to when you're alert and when you're awake. Um, the difference is, of course, that you've lost the muscle tone and you see these really large um, eye movements, these bursts of, of you know moving back and forth, which are your REMs essentially. Um, and so, of course, you could see on that epic that, that um, the uh, EEG is very similar to stage one. You see these small amplitude, high frequency waves, the muscles are relaxed. Um, and so the interesting thing about REM that, that you should keep in mind is essentially that um, this, is, this is a period of, of, this is a type of sleep where it is different from non-REM sleep. It's different from the stages. Um, we see that 
even though I say here that REM can't necessarily be made up after deprivation, we do see that there is attempts to, 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 to engage in more sleep. Um, you don't make it up necessarily hour for hour, but you do, you do see that, um, that attempts are made to, to spend in REM a little bit longer um, when you're doing your rebound sleep. And we'll talk about sleep deprivation, specifically REM and non-REM deprivation, um, and how the, the, the brain tries to make it up. We'll talk much more about that during that, during that series. Um, we know that REM is really important for non-declarative or implicit memories. Um, these are uh, memories about, um, for example, non-declarative memories are things that you can't really talk about. Um, so if you uh, learn how to ride a bike, for example, all the muscle movements involved with that, um, if you're an athlete and you're trying to learn a new technique, um, it's really important that you get plenty of REM sleep simply because uh, that's going to help you consolidate and process those memories and, 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 and put them into long term so that you can remember those movements later um, for when you're actually having to perform. So what's really important for, for athletes is to be able to essentially uh, to get plenty of sleep and plenty of, of non-REM sleep. Now, REM sleep is associated with dreaming. Um, a lot of people say, well, I don't dream during REM or I don't dream at all. Um, and what we find is that most people do dream. They just don't remember it. Um, they're not woken during REM, so they don't remember their dreams. Um, but you're going to be much more likely to remember a dream if you're woken, awoken from REM. You're also going to feel much more rested um, and you're going to not be sort of discombobulated. You know, if you are awoken from slow wave sleep, that is, you're very groggy, you hate the world, you don't know where you are, um, and a lot of us tend to wake from, from slow wave sleep and feel very tired throughout the day. But if you can sort of train yourself to wake during REM, then you'll feel much more rested throughout the day. Um, here's just kind of a, a chart to show you some of the differences between the stages and types of sleep. So that's something that's really good for you. The Moorcroft book I didn't assign because it's outdated, um, but it does have some good tables on there. Um, now, just to kind of give you a, an idea, this the Moorcroft book is where I've got a lot of these pictures from. Um, you know, when you see uh, uh, sleep in typical sleep in a in a in a person's um, throughout the night. What you typically see this, this is a an average young adult sleep period. You can see here is as the night progresses, the cylinders represent REM sleep. You actually spend much uh, more uh, in REM as the night progresses and then you wake. So here we can see wakefulness. You go from awake to one, stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, and then you uh, stay in stage four, go back to stage three, then to stage two, and then you hit REM. And then usually you hit, you know, kind of a, in between a one and a two, and then you go to two to three to four. And then, you know, and then you continue out throughout the night. You're spending more time in slow wave sleep and REM sleep throughout the night. Very rarely do you go back to stage one, only if you wake up or if there's a problem throughout the night. Um, and so each one of these represents a cycle of sleep. And for adults, uh, we experience 90-minute cycles at a time. So as the night progresses, you're spending more of that 90 minutes cycle in REM sleep. Um, and as you can see, uh, it, it, you go back and forth between really a slow wave sleep and, and REM sleep uh, in the beginning of the night. Um, now we see uh, that the first REM sleep period tends to come about 80 minutes into uh, the cycle um, into non-REM sleep. So that first cycle, you tend to spend very little time in REM sleep. Um, and again, they alternate about every 90 minutes. <clears throat> so this is a, an example, just kind of a rundown, a typical average of a young, uh, young adult of how much time you're spending, uh, how much percentage and how much time you're spending in each type of sleep. And this is about <clears throat> spending about seven hours completely sleeping. Um, you know, you're, you, you may not remember it, but you do tend to wake throughout the night. Um, and, uh, that can vary from, you know, one awakening to, you know, 50 awakenings. It just depends on how, how restful your sleep is. So this is a typical hypnogram. We refer to this as sleep architecture. It's basically the same thing I just showed you. I've got a lot of different examples so you can see that. And, you know, based on who you ask and, and, you know, the, the absolute, um, 
rules here. Um, they, they generally are about the same in terms of, of where you're spending the sleep, but you know, wake stage one, two, three, four, back to two into REM, two, three, four, three, two, REM, two, three, a lot of times slash four, back to two into REM. And so you just continue on throughout the night and spending more and more time into the REM cycle, uh, into the REM period. So again, about 90 minute cycles, so about 20% of the time you're spending in REM and you, you're spending about 50, 45 to 50% in stage two. And this is an average young adult, seven, eight hours of sleep. And again, another example here, this time you have the time. So you can kind of see if you go to bed at 10 and wake up at six ish, this is typically where you're spending sleep. And as you can see here, this has been broken to stage three. So you spend more time earlier in the night in that slow wave sleep, and then more time in REM as the night progresses. So if you cut your sleep off early, then you're going to be uh, lacking in REM. And then the next night, you might actually experience a little bit more REM earlier in the night to try to make up for that, but it's not, it's not minute to minute makeup. And just a breakdown, I've, I've gone over this before in sleep terms, just, uh, you know, just to kind of break down in REM, you see this dyssynchrony, very similar to how you see uh, that EEG and awake versus in slow wave sleep, you see, which is stages three and four, you see um, more of a, you see a synchronous activity, which is uh, big slow waves. In REM sleep, you see the muscle tone, uh, muscle movements inhibited except for very large twitches that, that get through. Um, in slow wave sleep, you do see some muscle tone and you do see some twitching and voluntary movements. In REM, you see the rapid eye movements, but in slow wave, you might not see any movement or very slow, uh, brain, uh, slow uh, eye movements. And REM, you tend to report very vivid dreams, but in slow wave, it tends to be uh, less vivid, more picture-like if you're going to dream at all. So that's just a, a, a rundown of some of the uh, cycles and, and stages of sleep. And hopefully uh, that was something that you were able to, uh, to get some good information from. If you have any questions, of course, you can uh, either email me or you can uh, uh, use the question forum. Um, and remember, you get extra credit for uh, asking good, solid questions. Um, and uh, you also get credit for... Um, answering questions. So just to uh, remind you to please use that question form and I'll address all of those questions um, in a live lecture. So have a good day.